Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. We're going to begin tonight with new video from the border. Many Haitian migrants seen making their way to another area of the Mexico United States border. As they leave the United States, we're going to take a look at what migrants in the Mexican city of Reynosa are facing. All this as we learn Mexico now helping the U.S. move migrants away from the border. Still thousands remain in Del Rio hoping to seek asylum tonight. Some relocated to other areas of the U.S. until their asylum case is heard. Others deported back to Haiti and some crossing back into Mexico where officials there have begun flying some Haitian migrants to other parts of Mexico. The Associated Press reporting that one Mexican official said migrants seeking asylum in Mexico will be moved to a detention center near the Mexico Guatemala border. Those in detention centers and who have not requested asylum will be flown to Haiti. Governor Greg Abbott in Del Rio today saying about 8600 migrants remain there tonight. Over in the Mexican city of Reynosa, just across from McAllen, another migrant camp is growing. Some Haitian migrants making the trip to the border city in Mexico. KRGV's Santiago Caicedo met up with some of those migrants in Reynosa. Ricardo Jefferson considers himself lucky. La, la population... Locals here in Mexico want to help us, but the National Guard doesn't, he says. Ricardo lived in Brazil for nearly four years and is part of a group of about 100 Haitian migrants that were able to make it to Reynosa. A lot of people hid and scattered. Very smart. On Saturday, Felicia Rangel Samponaro with the sidewalk school was on the highway headed to Reynosa and saw how the group of 300 Haitians dwindled due to a military checkpoint. The Mexican military police, they were initially helping by stopping traffic and blocking cars so they wouldn't hit all these men, women, children, babies that were along this highway. Some migrants were detained by Mexican immigration officials as they headed north to Reynosa from San Fernando, Tamaulipas. That's nearly the same distance as Falfurrias to Hidalgo, Texas, and many migrants were headed to the border on foot. Meanwhile, an already packed migrant camp in Reynosa has been concerning local officials for months as they go back and forth on ways to relocate migrants. Some have been there since March. The director of the Tamaulipas Migrant Resource Office in Reynosa says some nonprofits helping migrants are getting in the way of the state from being able to provide welfare checks on children in the camp and provide families with ways to get off the street. That was KRGV Santiago Caicedo reporting. The city of Reynosa now taping off a nearby park to keep that encampment from growing even larger. Many Haitians leaving after their president was assassinated and an earthquake, earthquake struck that country in August. We'll continue to follow this story on air and online on KSAT.com. Encouraging news on the COVID front. Cases of COVID-19 continue to trend downward, but Mayor Ron Nuremberg noting the Delta variant is leading to longer stays in the intensive care unit and on ventilators. And those longer stays leading to larger medical bills. It's why he continues to urge people to help protect themselves with a free COVID-19 vaccine. Tonight, our positivity rate dropping just below 5%. Encouraging news, 868 COVID-19 patients are hospitalized, though. About 314 in the intensive care unit and 196 people on ventilators. And as this is playing out, the federal government is pulling back on the use of a highly effective therapy to help COVID-19 patients recover quickly after they test positive. The administration trying to avoid a shortage. The night team's Patty Santos talks to a woman recovering from COVID-19 right now thanks to the monoclonal antibody therapy. Her message, get vaccinated. Go get vaccinated. I can say I was skeptical myself, but coming out of COVID and being on the other side, it's definitely something I wish I would have done sooner. Four days ago, Whitney Robinson received the monoclonal infusion therapy after testing positive a few days earlier. And I just feel it's such an amazing treatment that it should be talked about more because it definitely kept me 
out of the hospital. The treatment is made of proteins that mimic the immune system's ability to fight COVID. She's one of more than 4,600 patients who have received the infusion therapy at Freeman Coliseum since the center reopened on August 10th. BCFS, which operates the facility, says more than 4,500 of them have been adults and 36 have been minors between 12 to 17 years old. There has been a spike in demand for the drugs in state where hospitalizations are rising. The soaring demand for the therapy forced the federal government to put a cap on the use, pulling back on how much some facilities receive. People need to realize those uh, infusions cost $2,100. Uh, There's paid for by taxpayers as opposed to a shot that costs only $20. Medina Healthcare System is affected by the federal government's pullback. They've seen a steady increase in cases since late July. The hospital expected to receive 25 orders for the treatment this week compared to 100 weekly orders in the past. The hospital says most of their patients for the infusion are unvaccinated. A Medina Hospital has seen a decrease in their orders, but the state is actually increasing the supplies for Seguin. Now, uh, Robinson says she's going to be eligible to get the COVID-19 vaccine in about 90 days, which she says she's going to get. To find out more information about this therapy, you can go to casehead.com. Patty Santos reporting live. Thank you, Patty. We are just hours away from the start of the fall season. Officially, there are already some noticeable changes, though. Some windy conditions outside tonight. A lot of us looking forward to the temperatures. Meteorologist Adam Kasky tracking it all for us tonight, Adam. And as usual with these cold fronts, it takes a little bit of patience. You know, much anticipated, but the changes don't happen immediately. First, we're noticing the increasing wind. Then we'll have lower humidity and then temperatures will be on the downswing as well. So this all takes time and it's all happening overnight and even in the days to come. So first of all, steady winds out of the north at about 14 miles per hour. Some gusts in excess of 20, 25 miles per hour. Cold fronts just south of San Antonio continue and it's March southward. That north wind behind it is going to stay elevated tonight through the day tomorrow. So even look at midnight through sunrise tomorrow. Wind gusts around 30 to 35 miles per hour, gradually tapering off tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow evening. Temperatures behind the front. Well, they're already down in the 50s and 60s in North Texas. We're going to talk about the cooler air and really what it means for particularly our mornings in the days ahead and how long this humidity is going to be swept away coming up. Thank you, Adam. New tonight, he was sent to board a bus to Mexico City, but before he could make that trip, the San Antonio police put him in handcuffs. Investigators say Francisco Javier Garcia Ventura is suspected of tampering with evidence in connection to his girlfriend's disappearance. According to an arrest affidavit, he was arrested Sunday at a local bus station after family of the woman called police. That victim not identified in the affidavit. Police secured a search warrant for Garcia Ventura's apartment. They found blood and a security camera that had been ripped off. The affidavit goes on to say other surveillance footage shows Garcia Ventura leaving that apartment near the time of his girlfriend's disappearance with a heavy duty garbage bag. A crackdown on speeding. That's the request of several people living in a south side neighborhood after a teenager was hit by a car over the weekend. Neighbors there are taking another push to try to get the city to make a change. The night team's Jaffany Gray with their frustrations. Some of your neighbors may not want speed humps, and that's why we need a consensus. Residents living along Sligo Street. I want speed bumps. Speed bumps. Speed bumps. Some speed bumps, possibly. Uh, maybe some, some speed signs. Seem to be on the same page. We were there for several hours and saw multiple cars zoom by. The speed limit along this residential street, 30 miles per hour. People would drive at a high velocity. I mean, just fast. There's actually been deaths on this street. Mike Saldana and Conrad Palacios have lived here for several years. They say speeding worsened after the roads were repaved. I brought it up to Rebecca Villagran at a meeting about a year and a half ago, and um, they were working on the roads, and all I heard was that they were going to try and do a traffic study, but nothing became of that. Friday morning. I could have lost my son. Sylvia Cortez and her son Julian Gallardo said the need for speed bumps became even more critical. I hear a moaning and I didn't know nothing. I didn't think nothing of it, but when I looked, I see this woman cradling my son. Julian says like every morning, he usually walks down this sidewalk to cross the street to get to the bus stop. But this particular morning, as he was crossing the middle of the roadway, that's when he was hit by the car. The impact so strong that he ended up all the way back here in his neighbor's driveway. 
I was a little traumatized by that, by the fact that I was hit by a car and it was painful and it was hard for me to breathe at that time. After spending four and a half days in the hospital, he was discharged today with several injuries and a lot of road rash. District 3 Councilwoman Phyllis Villagran says she is now looking into this issue. We have to look at that vision zero and making sure that we are being mindful of, of where we are on the streets. Slow down, understand you're in a residential area, and let's work to avoid accidents like this. Now, Villagran says in order for any action to be taken as far as speed bumps, residents need to fill out an application, have the application reviewed, petition for signatures, and if warranted, the city has to do a study. It's a long process. The neighbors tell me they are already starting as we speak. Live from City Hall, Daphne Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Daphne. Still ahead on the night, be caught up in construction. It's an issue that several San Antonio businesses say they are experiencing what the road work is meant to accomplish and why these Broadway businesses are worried. Coming up. And it's a case that continues to develop the autopsy in the Gabby Petito case and the effort to find a lone person of interest in that case next on the Night Beat. Drones, ATVs, canine units out in full force in the search for Brian Laundrie. He is the lone person of interest in the Gabby Petito case. The FBI confirming her body was found in Wyoming on Sunday. Stones assembled in the shape of a cross mark the site near the spot where she was found. Her death ruled a homicide. And while investigators begin to uncover answers in Wyoming, thousands of miles away in Florida, the search for laundry continues. Back here at home, if you've driven downtown, you've probably hit a few detours. Along with turning away drivers, some are concerned it could be turning away business. Construction is planned for Broadway running from East Houston Street to East Hildebrand Avenue. Broadway barriers, now a common site for parts of that section. Currently, the project is in phase one, the lower segment, which encompasses Broadway from East Houston Street to the I-35 overpass. You can see where Broadway is cut off at Jones Avenue tonight. The construction project includes additional street lights, road repairs, bike lanes. Business owners hope the $42 million construction project doesn't keep customers away. For the owner of Augie's Barbed Wire Barbecue, this construction along Broadway near 9th Street is more than an inconvenience. Guests are having to try and detour off of detours, which is making it difficult for guests to kind of kind of hang out and eat some barbecue, you know. He, along with other businesses along this stretch, are already struggling due to the pandemic. It's hit us at least 80% of our business. Uh, the, the closure of Broadway is like a major clog in the artery, if you will. We're like a ghost town sometimes over here on Broadway. The 2017 bond project on Broadway from East Houston Street to East Hildebrand Avenue started in July of 2020. According to the city's Broadway Street Corridor website, it should be mostly completed by December 2023. These pictures show what the area will look like once it's complete. Better roadways, expanded sidewalks, bike lanes in some areas, more lighting and trees and improved drainage. But these improvements can't come soon enough. I talked to other restaurants in this area and they're slow too. Cortez says he thinks the improvements will be a great addition. He just hopes he and other businesses in this area will still be open to see the finished product. I'm just humbled and thankful for any guest that comes by to have lunch or dinner just to kind of keep us alive and make things work. You can find a list of closures with alternate routes on the Broadway Street Corridor website. Again, you can expect construction through at least the end of 2023. Look outside with live cam tonight. The focus is on the changes, this cold front and what that means for us, Adam. And it, it doesn't mean sweaters, hot cocoa and whatnot, but it does mean some noticeable changes and they're already taking place. First is the wind. The winds are picking up out of the north. That's going to then drop the humidity and then have a big impact on our temperatures and the lingering rain we have out there south of town. That's going to be ending as well momentarily. Cooler mornings ahead.
We're going to chat about that in a minute and how it even compares to the average for this time of year. Let's first take a look at the radar. We had a few downpours move through San Antonio earlier today. Five hundredths of an inch at the airport. And by the way, we had a high of 95 today. 100 yesterday, 95 today, and then about 10 degrees cooler tomorrow. So the lingering showers now are southeast of town, especially Victoria toward Goliad, just south of Carn City. And these are all moving southward and moving out of our area and one just near Brackettville gradually coming to an end. Big pictures shows the front stretching all the way up into the eastern portion of the country, all the way to the Great, the great Lakes and into Canada as well. That's where most of the rain is. We were on the tail end of this front as usual, and we didn't squeeze out a whole lot of moisture, but a few folks got a quick downpour again, five hundredths of an inch at the airport. Let's talk temperatures and how they're going to be changing primarily in the mornings ahead. That's where we'll notice the main and biggest impact. I mean, about a 20 degree drop when you compare morning readings from earlier this week to later on, especially by Thursday. So temperatures now 58 Lubbock, Amarillo 57. Abilene 69, you get to Austin 81, Del Rio 80, San Antonio 84. So where the wind is coming from, yes, there's some cooler air there, but it takes time for it to really get into place here. Tomorrow morning, low to mid 60s. We'll say about 65 here in San Antonio, and that's just a few degrees below the average of 68. But notice by Thursday and Friday, we're down in the 50s for morning low temperatures. So big difference from the temperatures well into the 70s we've had over the past several mornings. Talk about the dew points as well. Humidity, it's starting to drop. Dew point now 56 in San Antonio. So we've noticed a change here in town, but it's going to take longer for those of you south of San Antonio, basically south of Highway 90. The hill country already refreshing with dew points in the 40s. And you look where that wind is coming from upstream. Dew points in the 30s to right near 40. And that's where we're going to be tomorrow all the way through the weekend. I mean, we'll see a little rise in the mugginess on Sunday, but you're not going to really feel it until we get into Monday. So this is going to be a good long break from the high humidity and mugginess. Tomorrow morning, 50s in the hill country, 57 Fredericksburg, Rock Springs 59, about 64 in Uvalde, Canyon Lake 64 degrees to start the day. By the afternoon, we're talking 80s for the vast majority of us. A little bit closer to 90 as you get closer to the Rio Grande, but Stone Oak about 84, Castroville 85, New Braunfels 86, Timberwood Park 82 for the high tomorrow, but it's going to stay gusty. That north northeasterly wind steady at 10 to 20 and at times gusting to about 30 to 35. Wall to wall sunshine tomorrow as well. We'll have some high thin clouds, but that's about it. We talked about the mornings, but Thursday morning, Friday morning, if you like to wake up early, get that long jog or bike ride in or just enjoy going to the bus stop with the kids. Very different feeling out there. Low humidity and back down in the 50s. And notice those highs remaining in the mid to upper 80s through the end of the week and into the weekend. Not a big jump, just low 90s by Sunday. Next chance of rain, by the way, isn't until next week. Going to feel good. Thanks, Adam. All right, the Cowboys defense played a lot better in game two than they did in game one. Greg. And because of the flexibility of one particular player, their number one draft pick, they were able to make adjustments for players who were out due to either injury or COVID reserve list. When we come back, we're talking about the versatility of Micah Parsons and what he was able to do. Look at that. There's Russia, the quarterback right there, trying to get a sack. He did get one, by the way. And the game of the week for Me TV and Texas Sports Productions is a doozy coming up. Football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. One of the big reasons for the Cowboys success against the Chargers in Los Angeles last Sunday was the versatility of number one draft pick Micah Parsons after Demarcus Lawrence broke his foot in practice and is now out for the next six to eight weeks. It was defensive coordinator Dan Quinn's idea to move Parsons from linebacker to defensive end. Remember, they were already down Randy Gregory was on the COVID reserve list and at the time did not know if Donovan Wilson would be able to play and as it turned out he did not. In his first start at defensive end, Parsons collected a sack and a tackle for a loss of the Cowboys 20 to 17 victory over the Chargers. I would not have asked him to do that if I didn't think he was ready to do it. And this is the best thing for us to go win this game. And so he said, okay, I'm down, I'm into it. And so that's to me, um, you know, I wouldn't have even considered it had I not thought he could handle it. We'll see what the Cowboys cook up against their NFC East rivals, the Philadelphia Eagles, this Monday night in their home opener. The Houston Texans will start a rookie quarterback this Thursday night when they host the Carolina Panthers at NRG Stadium. This after head coach David Culley advises he will not activate Deshaun Watson, even after Tyrod Taylor suffered a hamstring injury that could 
keeping him out of business here for four weeks and said today Watson will not even practice with the team this week. That said, will the fact Mills got to play the entire second half after Taylor's injury help him in his first NFL start? Tremendously. As a matter of fact, after the game, I think during the interview process, he uh, he mentioned how comfortable he was. He didn't really feel like uh, there was anything happening to him that he wasn't prepared for. And after going back and watching the video, there really wasn't anything that they did that would confuse him or did anything any differently. Uh, he handled himself well and, and I expect him to do the same thing this week. All right, kickoff in Houston on Thursday night is set for 7.20 p.m. When the UTSA Roadrunners travel to Memphis to face the Tigers this Saturday, they'll be three-point underdogs in a battle of the early unbeatens. Both come into Saturday's showdown with a 3-0 record with the Roadrunners coming off a 27-13 victory over Middle Tennessee and the Tigers off a 31-29 victory over Mississippi State. This will be the first meeting ever between these two schools after their original meeting had to be called off last year during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now the Roadrunners will be looking for their first 4-0 start since 2012. It will be up to the Roadrunners defense that is ranked 10th in the nation to shut down the Tigers up-tempo offense, including Conference USA's reigning defensive player of the week. All year we haven't played a tempo team yet until this uh, this Saturday against Memphis. So we're just trying to just get adjusted to it and uh, get adjusted to the humid because it's going to be pretty humid there. So we're just trying to get uh, uh, the speed on, on track for us. They recruited a lot of speed and they stayed with that plan. And uh, they just done a fantastic job. I wish I knew. We're, we're trying to copy it, right? And the crowd shows up. They've got a great fan base, great boosters. Uh, they got large budgets. Uh, they, they've got it all going. They've, they've, they've got it going. It's one of the uh, programs we study and want to be like one day. All right, kickoff on Saturday in Memphis will be at 2.30. It'll be nationally broadcast on ESPNU. The KSAT 12 BTV Texas Sports Productions Game of the Week. Next. KSAT 12 BTV Texas Sports Productions Game of the Week will feature a battle of the unbeatens as the third-ranked Smithson Valley Rangers in 12 stop 12 facing ninth-ranked New Braunfels Unicorns. The Unicorns are off to a surprising 4-0 star following their huge 24-21 upset of the Jutsa Rockets in Converse last Thursday night. Prior to that, the Unicorns have wins over San Marcos, Seguin, and Canyon. Meantime, the Smithson Valley Rangers are also 4-0 with wins over Warren, Madison, El Paso, Eastwood, and opening district play with a dominating 42-14 victory over Wagner. It's going to be a great atmosphere, great game. Uh, I think our fans expect a lot from us, and, and uh, we're, we're just going to go into it with our all. We've been carrying a lot of good momentum through the past four games, 4-0 four now. So I think the momentum's definitely there, but we still got to go in plan our best. All right, kickoff is set for 7 p.m. in Unicorn Stadium on Thursday. You can see it all live on MeTV, KSAT 12 Digital Point 2. The Smithson Valley Volleyball team in action tonight is South Sand. Rangers versus Bobcats. First hit is a good one. Alyssa Contreras with a spike down the line. It pulls South Sand within two points, 10 to 8. But Smithson Valley responds. Rebecca Williams gets the push shot to drop along the baseline. Part of a 4-0 run. Then a few plays later, Lily Johnson coming right at you with a spike to the back line. The Rangers win the match to remain undefeated in the district at 4-0. And Italia High School, Mustang hosting both at a battle of two of the best teams in District 27-3A. Pirates rolling in the second set here. Chloe Naglin hammers a cross-court kill to cap a 6-0 run. Both in control now, 16-6. Natalia hanging tough, though. Kylie Spangler gets up for the huge block to get the team all fired up. But the Pirates, too good tonight. J.C. Savoda gets the dump shot to fall in the middle of the court. Post sweeps Natalia to remain undefeated in the district. Have more highlights and reaction from the match on our website, ksat.com, later tonight. All right. Thank you, Greg. You got it. We'll be right back. Take a look at this. A four-legged friend paid a visit to a library in Lexington, Kentucky. Hank the Horse was brought hmm. in to encourage kids to read. Usually, kids check out a library book and take it to the farm to read to Hank and other rescue horses. It's all part of the Pages for a Purpose program. Well, this weekend, Hank decided to pay a visit, and he happened to get his own library card in the process. Where does he keep it? That's a question <laughs> I don't have an answer to. Well, good for Hank. The barn. Good for Hank. Oh, man, I just can only think of the cleanup. I'm sorry. I can't yeah, I was thinking that, too. Risky. I'm like, where's the guy following oh, Hank in the library? So risky. All right, so sunny for the rest of the week. No rain chances until early next week, especially some cooler morning, mornings by Thursday, Friday. So many questions for Hank. <laughs> we need more. Maybe a case that explains. Yeah, let's do it. I'm in. All on Hank. Hank, call us. GMSA Hank. at 430. Good night.